Hey there, this is Ben Currier, self-proclaimed world's number one failure. In this podcast, we'll learn about the hardest moments my guests faced and the failures they endured on their path towards making it. I hope you enjoy. Hey, it's Ben here, and in addition to this podcast, I also teach Microsoft Excel online. Visit ExcelExposure.com for more information and use the coupon code FAILURE for 20% off of the lifetime access to the course. Stay tuned after the episode for a little bit more information as to why it's so important to improve your Excel skills and unlock your inner Excel ninja. Thanks. Hey there, friends of failure, and welcome to this week's episode of the Failure Guy podcast. Today, I have Jen Harris. Uh, Jen, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? And is it Jennifer or Jen? I don't know. I, I shortened it myself just because I like Ben shortened, but I didn't know if it was the way to do it. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, cool. And do you want to give the listeners a, a little bit of a shameless self-promotion or what I call a humble brag where you get to talk about all the cool, good things you've done before we get into maybe some of the more uh, failure moments of your career? Sure. That's a great place to start. So I actually will incorporate my failure just a little bit because that's what all of my success is around. But I uh, recently went through a divorce and as part of that, uh, had a lot of failure, which I'm sure we'll get into, but I was able to reconstruct it and transform it into something quite positive. I have since become a highly trained and certified transformation and confidence divorce coach. I've spoken on stage to thousands to help them get through their divorces as well and overcome struggles in general in order to really thrive and achieve their desired outcomes in business, life, and divorce. And then I went on to write a book called Divorce Bucket List. Wow. Well, that sounds like a lot. So do you primarily help uh, women or do you go on both sides of the of the spectrum? I actually go on both sides. It's funny because when I first started getting into it, I thought that I would probably attract mostly women because a lot of the times I think the assumption out there is that women are very big into self-help, but my first few clients were actually men. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming divorce is easy for almost nobody. So Right. Having, having somebody on their side who's been through it um, certainly sounds like a good way to approach it. What's, um, what's the way that you find most of your clients or how do they find you? Is there a certain method you have for seeking out those who are most recently <laughs> divorced and struggling or, or going through the process? Sorry, right? You, typically? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a lot of social media marketing slash kind of attraction is what I would call it. So people looking for that help. And then once they get that help, they see that, you know, there's more value out there. And it's kind of like, you know, if you were a professional athlete going to the Olympics or you wanted to train to go to the Olympics, you'd get yourself somebody that's been through it or knows how to do it so that you didn't have to spend hours trying to learn and then train yourself. It's kind of like that. They see that I've been through it, that I've learned uh, different approaches on how to achieve desired outcomes. And like you said, though, it is, uh, you know, any phase of the divorce. So I work with people that have just, they're thinking about it. Maybe it, they're just entertaining the idea and they're trying to make the decision. I work with people that just found out that they're going to go through it anywhere in between to the whole way to they've finalized and they're just trying to rebuild and live their desired life. Well, that sounds awesome. So how did you, during your process, uh, what help did you lean on for, uh, for, for your divorce? So I, uh, at first, uh, was trying to just lean on friends and family and found that to be very ineffective as far as coping. And I mean, I could survive that way, I'm sure. Uh, but it, it ended up, you know, turning into a lot of negative behaviors and, uh, kind of spiraled out of control a little bit. So then I started leaning on counselors and coaches and mentors, as well as I literally just tripped and fell <laughs> into creating this divorce bucket list process. A friend of mine and I identified that I am totally type A and that I literally will not do anything unless it's on a list. Mm-hmm. And so once, once I had gone through all the too much time on Tinder, too much time drinking, all the negative coping mechanisms, we said, all right, it's time to sit down. It's time to change. 
And we came up with this list of things I could do to focus on myself. And I really, between leaning on that, which is what I do with my clients as well, we incorporate that into whatever phase they are in leaning on that mixed with the coaching of having someone in my corner, like an actual trained, uh, support system that also knows what it's like to go through it. Cause sometimes friends and family, they want to be there for you, but they don't really know how. And so once I was able to find that support and, uh, create that structure, that's when it, everything, you know, kind of helped me really truly get through it. Yeah. I would imagine friends and family get on more on the side of trying to make you feel better and just say, everything's going to be okay. And don't really give you much actionable advice. Um, so what gave you the idea for the, for the divorce bucket list? You know, I, I was having wine one night on my friend's porch and Mm -hmm. I was telling them how I had just gone, (laughs) I had just gone and, uh, met somebody from Tinder at a bar. It was the first time I ever just randomly went to a bar just to meet someone I didn't know. Normally I would go with friends and, you know, Mm -hmm. it was a a different experience for me, uh, especially because I got married at a very young age. So I never really dated uh, and then, you know, got thrown into the the dating pool. And I explained how, as some may take shame in this, I decided to own up to it. I went home from the bar with that person and it (laughs) turned into this uh, really interesting experience actually. So Uh, it, you know, obviously all the stuff that you think happened, happened, but it also turned into this night where I don't know, it was like one of these people that you're just kind of meant to meet, I think. And, uh, I was able to kind of open up and finally let out emotions after months and months of bottling them in. And I was telling my friend about this and they were like, well, that's great that you're now facing your emotions, but I think you need to do it in a healthier way. How can we do this? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you know, I was very, um, I, I was running my own business aside from what I'm doing now. It was a different one. I was running my own business at the time. And I was like, listen, when I'm doing my business stuff, I'm succeeding in that. And the only way I'm doing it is by making these lists. And I sit down and I get to them and I put things in emotion. I said, what if we create a list of things for me to focus on me, focus on my, my kids, myself rebuilding you know, facing and doing scary things, doing things that I've always wanted to do, but never did, you know, and really just finding myself again so that I can rebuild and not just survive, but reach desired outcomes throughout this process. So we just started going down and and putting things on this list and then there it was born. That sounds awesome. So I imagine a lot of it is hopefully, or I mean, just uh, imagining what you'd like to put on there is is more self care stuff, self love stuff, so that you don't feel like you need a relationship to necessarily be the the thing that makes you feel whole. I would imagine because that's probably a lot of the traps that people fall into with marriage and relationships is feeling like they need that other person. So I imagine on the bucket list, I hope there's some self love, self care things that'll bring you to feeling confident when you're not in a relationship as well. Is there that type of stuff? Yes, absolutely. And you hit it right on the head. It's really about building your confidence and empowering yourself again and redefining your life. Because like you said, when you're in this relationship, it often feels like, you know, you're in this marriage that is your forever. Everything you've built is based on this partnership. And when that partnership breaks, it often seems like your world's crashing around you. Everything that was your future is now crumbling. And so, you know, I, you know, we kind of, when I created my accidental divorce bucket list, we kind of just threw it together out Mm -hmm. of our heads, but I've since developed a process after getting training and, and becoming certified in confidence and transformation where we go through a process of kind of self-discovery and, you know, figuring out what, what you can put on there. That's going to empower you going to build your confidence, going to help you achieve things that, you know, maybe you would had always wanted to do, but again, you got into this relationship and it became a partnership and things fell to the side. And, and when people start doing those things, they start feeling good again and it empowers them to do even more. And it's just this cycle, you know, of empowerment followed by action, followed by empowerment. And you, you step into this whole new confident version of yourself. Well, that sounds awesome. What do you, what do you do though with people like me who are not huge into lists and kind of find them scary? Do you, is there any helpful ways that you guide them through it without them making them feel like they have a giant to-do list uh, waiting for them? 
Yeah. So I am a very energetic and hands-on coach with people, but I, I do take it at the pace that they want. So for example, I, I do have a client that I was working with recently and he was like you just said, you are very hands off with lists. He, he wanted nothing to do with the list. So I, I'm able to create the list for someone without it seeming like you're working on a list, but then we work together, you know, to get through the the actions. And I always like to approach these lists because they are intimidating, right? Like, like when I, when I made my list, there were things on it that were small, but there were things on it that were big. And I was like, I'm never going to do that, but I did mm-hmm. in the end. But the only way I did that is by taking baby steps and and little small, small steps towards the the action and the end result. So I like to go into it with the idea that you don't have to say, uh, cause this is a common one on, I don't know why, I guess it's just a dream for everyone, but to run like a race or a marathon. So you don't have to go in and say, okay, I want to race or I want to run a race or uh, do a marathon and um, you know, the next day do it. That's not the the goal here, but you can put that on your list and then say, all right, I'm going to take one small step. I'm just going to pick a fun theme that I want to research to find a race, or I'm just going to sign up for a race two years from now, or maybe I'm just going to walk 10 steps today. You know, it's, it's small things, but then we build upon that until you're finally at your destination. Yeah. um, I think it was James Clear who was saying, you don't want to necessarily run a marathon, but you just want to become a runner. So you want to start doing some of the things that would lead you towards that ultimate goal, but you really got to start with the smaller, the smaller stuff, the habits that get you into the process of, of, of actually doing that. Does any of the bucket lists have to focus on what you want out of the next relationship? Yeah. So that is something that's almost an addendum. I would say like a side piece to the bucket list. A lot of the times people, a lot of my clients, uh, one of the big things on their bucket list is to get back out there to date again. Cause a lot of the times when I start working with people, they're not, they, some, some have found a new relationship, but sometimes they haven't. And if they haven't, that's definitely one of the things is I want to get back out there and I want to find someone that, you know, I'm worthy of. Cause they start, you know, as you start doing this divorce bucket list, you start realizing your worth and you start to refuse to settle for much less. And so there is a whole process that we go through on identifying and defining your perfect partner and mm-hmm. then becoming aware of how to, I don't want to say manifest because it's not magic, yeah. but there is neuroscience and brain science behind af- things like affirmations and, and def- definition, putting definition and visualization around what you want. And that's kind of what we focus on. No, that sounds good. I think a lot of people also probably need help with boundaries and setting uh, adequate boundaries for what they will or won't accept out of a future Mm -hmm. person, especially if they've been in a relationship that uh, was specifically one way and they haven't tried other things. Uh, I imagine they have something in their minds as to what a relationship should look like that sometimes Mm -hmm. need to be deconstructed and reconstructed depending on just how toxic or whatever that, that last relationship was. Exactly. Yep. And uh, what how, do you want to walk us through your story at all a little bit on your uh, divorce? We heard the post uh, divorce, um, figuring out how to do the bucket list, but what was the um, actual process um, like for you? Yeah. So I guess I'll start at the beginning then. So I actually met my now ex-husband a year after, almost a year after graduating college. So I was very young. You know, I didn't have a lot of life experience at that time. But also, I didn't even know, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I had some pretty deep seated issues from my childhood. And we all listen, if you came out of your childhood unscathed, then you're lying. So we (laughs) all have them. But, you know, I had not done any work to to work through the things from my childhood. And so I was bringing some things into relationships, you know, even high school relationships I had that I wasn't aware of were toxic behaviors. And so I went into my marriage with the same and we had met in, we had met in May. We were uh, engaged at the beginning of August, moved in together at the beginning of September and found out we were pregnant a week later. So. Wow. That's quick. Yeah. 
It was quick. And I'm not, I, I, I always like to say, I'm not judging or saying that a quick relationship will always be a failure or ended failure, mm -hmm. because I do know a lot of people that have a similar story that are married 25 years later. So happy. And that's great. Everyone's story is different, but mine, this was my experience was that, you know, we were very young. We, we, neither of us had dealt with our issues and we dove in, you know, we, we, fell into the passion of it. And, you know, we got pregnant really quick. So it, it wasn't easy to walk away, even when we did see signs of a failing relationship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, you know, we were able to maintain a certain level of decency in the marriage. Uh, but at one point I did find out that unbeknownst to me, my now ex-husband was struggling with addiction. And when I found that out, you know, at this point still, I had not, because I wasn't forced to, I had not faced my, my own toxic behaviors or negative behaviors. And mm -hmm. so not only that, but I didn't get the help needed to stay married to someone that is trying to recover from addiction. So there was codependency on my side. It became a very, very toxic environment and I didn't believe in divorce. So I refused to walk away he finally, you know, because of both of it just got so bad. He finally said, you know what, this, this needs to end. And, you know, I'm grateful that he had the courage for that, but it didn't make it any easier because for me, I didn't believe in it. And yeah, it doesn't exist. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and also, you know, when you go into a divorce, the, the big, the hardest fear, I think in this world, even scarier than scarier than snakes and spiders is the unknown. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, walking up against that was one of the hardest things that I've ever gone through in my life. Yeah. And I imagine uh, just the outward uh, life that you're living towards everyone showing, hey, this is my husband, like the, the just how relationship promotion -y you are during that time, you know, everything's going great and things are good. And then all of a sudden you have to tell everybody that things weren't going as well as you had thought. So it's, it must be not only the unknown, but also having to face a lot of people and, and come up with different ways of explaining why things did or didn't work, which must get exhausting if, if I had to imagine. Yeah. And at the time when, when my divorce first started, uh, I, am no longer in network marketing, but I was a top leader at a company in network marketing, which meant that I was very, very present on social media and seriously, like seven times a day would post on, on social media, what was going on in my life. And so hmm. obviously, you know, being married, having kids, living the dream life was a huge part of that. And so this was, this was the definition of failure, you know, in everyone's eyes, you know, I was supposed to be this person running, juggling a successful business, working also a full-time career and staying married, you know, and, and I was essentially failing at that. Yeah. I imagine depending on how the name change went too, that was probably a bit of a rebranding for any of your uh, networking type of stuff uh, going through all that. I actually didn't change my name because Oh, good. <laughs> so my, I, we, we do have two sons. And so I just, I decided that because of my children, I would keep my name as is for now. Who knows what's going to happen down the road. I am in a, in a super healthy long-term relationship right now. We've had that conversation a little bit, you mm -hmm. know, like, oh, you know, what would my name be? But not, we haven't, I didn't, it's a name, you know, yeah. but for me, yes, that was another aspect of it was you know, I am branded as Jennifer Harris and, you know, I, I published my book as Jennifer Harris, which mm -hmm. is ironic considering that is my divorce name, but it, you know, it's just, you know, who I have grown into. And so we'll see. Yeah. I mean, my mom kept her last name, even though my parents were only married for three years just to have okay. the same name as, as me basically. So, uh, mm -hmm. so I totally get that. You mentioned codependency in your relationship. Is there anything you give uh, in terms of advice to your current clients or future clients on on how to rid yourself of some of those codependent uh, traits or or things traps that are easy to fall into? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because if I have to say this to someone, this advice that I'm going to give, more often than not, they don't want to hear it. But <laughs> get expert help. You know, you cannot do it on your own and maybe you're not 
ready to talk to someone yet. Maybe. And by expert help, I just mean a professional, you know, just talk to a professional or maybe just someone that's been through it, get a support system around you. And I don't mean friends and family. I mean, people that have been through it, that know it. There's so many Facebook groups out there, club house, like there there's use social media. Don't be afraid of social media and the support that can be out there, but the, it's a learning curve. So professionals are professionals because they learned what they know. And we don't know what we don't know. Like I said before, you can't go into, you know, battling codependency and falling into those traps. If you don't know what they are, and you could learn that on your own. Absolutely. But the time it's going to take you to do that, you're going to still be battling your stuff and it's just going to get worse and worse. So, you know, get ahead of that learning curve by enlisting the help of a professional or support group. And you know what? Read, read as much as you can about it. Just get educated about it. Mm-hmm. And so for professional help, you would recommend, I imagine a therapist, maybe one that specializes in divorce. Yeah. I mean, I had for myself, when I first started getting into professional help for the stuff that I'd gone through in my childhood, as well as codependency, it was through just a a generic um, counselor, Mm -hmm. psychologist, but I eventually ended up kind of creating a team for myself where I had a counselor and a coach. So a counselor is going to help you dig into the why, right? And really get into the mental understanding of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And they'll give you tools and resources too, but a coach is going to help you kind of amplify that and take it to the next level because they're going to remove a little bit of the emotions and they're going to be more results oriented and focused on getting there. Mm-hmm. Just like if you, you know, wanted to exceed in, in a career, you might have a career coach or a mentor at your job. That's going to teach you the things that you don't yet know there, but they're also going to coach you on and and hook you up with the tools and resources you need to. So that's kind of what I did uh, as I was going through it. Yeah. That sounds like a good combination, Uh, you know, someone to help with the, with the current emotions, but also someone to pep you up and get you ready for the future that you probably think doesn't exist at that moment Mm -hmm. uh, in time. What made you decide to take this you know, the, the, the trauma you went through in your divorce and then make it into something that you could then spread to other people and help them out. What, what gave you that courage and, 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 uh, led you towards that decision. So I was, as I was going through my divorce bucket list that I had made for myself, I was kind of just going down and checking things off. And one of the things that I put on there, and this is, I go in a lot more detail in, in this, in, in my book, but I'll just give us some, a quick summary. One of the things that I had put on there was that I wanted to take a solo trip. And in, in my mind, it was this grand finale trip that I was going to take. And it was going to be like eat, love, pray, and, you know, healing and romance and excitement. Right. And I didn't know though. Like I, I just wrote take solo trip and I didn't define what that was going to be. Mm-hmm. And uh, a couple months into working on my divorce bucket list, I got a phone call and I was invited to speak on a stage at a convention in London. And I thought, okay, this might be that solo trip that I was talking about. Now that wouldn't take place for yet, you know, another nine months or so. But I started planning it out and I said, you know what, I'm going to go a week early. I'm going to go by myself and I'm going to go on this trip. And I went and it was everything I dreamed of. And at the end, I stood on stage. Now it was a business speech, but a lot of what I was doing in that business had to do with personal life and overcoming, you know, mind, mindset and and reaching goals and and outcomes despite obstacles. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of the the speech I was giving kind of the, you know, you can achieve this no matter who you are or what you've been through or what you're going through. And uh, when I was in London, we had the, the day before that speech, we had a kind of like a get together, like a, a dinner of sorts, Mm -hmm. I guess in um, uh, what's that bridge called tower Tower bridge Bridge, in tower bridge in London. Oh, it was, they, they lit it up and we had the whole thing running out. It was beautiful, but I arrived there with fresh ink. I had just gotten a new tattoo of a crown because I had told my, my one friend arrived at the end of my solo trip as the business trip was starting a coworker. I call her a Mm -hmm. friend. Uh, And we had said, you know, I was like, listen, I put my crown back on, on this trip. 
and how fitting, you know, that we're in London, it's royal. So, yeah, you know, we went and I got a tattoo of a crown to symbolize that. So, of course, walking around with that, everyone's asking me questions. I'm telling them the story of the divorce bucket list and how I ended up going on this and everything. And they said, Jen, you got to tell this story tomorrow, like on state. This has got to be part of your speech. Mm -hmm. And I was like, OK, so I go home and I rewrite my whole speech and I get up on stage and I tell it. And, you know, this thousands of people standing ovation. I have hundreds of people coming up to me afterwards, telling me how much they can relate, how their marriage is threatened, or they've been through a divorce or they're going, or they're thinking. And, and I was, and so many people told me, you know, I, or maybe they know someone, but the main message was more people need to hear this. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, you know, after, after hearing that, that I would do what it took to use my trauma to help other people overcome theirs, inspire them to get through it as well as teach them. Well, that sounds like a really cool trip that you ended up taking. And uh, when they originally invited you, it wasn't related to uh, divorce. You said it was a business speech, but you kind of gave it a nice spin to uh, incorporate your story. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep. Yep. It was originally a business speech. I mean, it was the whole point was overcoming obstacles to reach your your outcome. So it just oh, okay. was perfect for it. And they knew what I was going through. You know, they knew what I was achieving despite what I was going through. So I think it was assumed that I was going to talk about the divorce, but I hadn't intended to go as far in depth with the whole divorce bucket list approach. That's really when it was born into kind of a formalized process, I would say. Well, that sounds cool. And it's, and it seems like, um, from what I saw and from what a little bit of what you said, you also try to incorporate some mindfulness and well being practices into your coaching. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Because our brains are muscles, just like a lot of the other things, just like our muscles are muscles. <laughs> our brain is a muscle in a similar way. So it's like you can't, you can't walk into a gym on a Monday and look around the gym and then walk out and just be a super fit athlete, you know, or lose 10 pounds or have a flat stomach. It doesn't work that way for most people. Some mm -hmm. people are lucky. They can just walk in and look, but others have to go, you know, a couple, they have to have a habit of it, a routine, and they have to go maybe four days a week or do this amount of reps or whatnot to get their desired goals. And the same thing is with your brain, you know, there's neuroscience out there with the way that our brain filters information and the way that we can train our brain to think differently. And really, you know, there's two ways to look at life. I've learned through this process, you can either look at it as happening to you or, and you know, Oh, what was me? This happened today. Or you can say, all right, this is happening around me and I have control over what I think about it and how I react to it. And the more mindfulness you practice, the more you train your brain and your thinking the more, the better quality of a life you're going to have and the more that you're going to be able to achieve. Yeah. And I imagine that you'd also say to bring that into any future relationships, both of you continue that, that mindfulness journey, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. I have a, maybe a tough question, possibly, because uh, if, if there are listeners out there who see some people who are going to get married and they should not get married in their opinion, uh, do you think is there anything you can either say to people or is it is it kind of stay out of it, <laughs> even though you might have a pretty good inkling that this is the wrong idea, especially if it's somebody you care about that's going into a uh, headlong into a what seems to be a toxic relationship? Is there any advice you'd give to anyone uh, either in that situation themselves or know somebody who might be going down the wrong path? So. I'm very, actually very torn on this answer because I would say it does depend on the relationship. I think a great general rule of thumb is that we can never really control what someone else is going to do. So it is a very delicate area because mm -hmm. often the perspective from the outside is greater than from the inside. So I actually like to compare it to this. If you are getting a group picture taken and you're in the group picture, you know, whether or not you're smiling, you might know whether or not someone's hands on your shoulder or whatnot, but you don't really know what else is going on around you. The photographer that's taking the picture sees everything. Mm -hmm. So they might know someone behind you is giving you bunny ears, you know, and it's kind of like that where you don't really know until the picture's taken and someone hands you the picture in a way that you can truly see it, that you can say, oh, I, that person was giving me bunny ears or that person over there wasn't smiling or had their eyes closed. 
And it's a lot like that when it comes to relationships, whether it's, you know, to get married or not a toxic relationship or even divorce for me, it didn't matter who told me Mm -hmm. that I needed to get a divorce. It didn't matter who told me, sorry, mom, a million times not to get married. (laughs) I was in the picture. Yeah. I didn't have the full perspective. And so I couldn't see what other people were seeing, but I wasn't open to seeing it either. Had I been handed that picture in a way I could see it, Mm -hmm. perhaps I would have said, oh, well, they're giving me bunny ears. Let me tell them to stop, set new boundaries or get out. (laughs) Right. Yeah. So it's, it is a delicate situation because it's hard as a brother, sister, a friend to give them that picture in the way that they can see it like you do. Yeah. And not have it come across as judgy or ill-informed or even get them more entrenched probably in what they're already doing, especially the closer to the wedding that it gets. Yes. (laughs) And you don't want to be public enemy number one, because Mm -hmm. if they are dead set on this marriage and this relationship and they only see their uh, vision of it, Mm -hmm. what's that tunnel vision? If they're, if they're only seeing in their tunnel, they got blinders on. Yeah. Yeah. Then whatever you say, if, if the more you fight, the more that they may retaliate and view you as the problem instead of the relationship. So I think the best thing to do is to empower them to live their best life. So maybe I'm going to try to come up with an example here on the fly, Uh but maybe if you're, you know, you see someone and you think that their spouse is emotionally negative to them. And so you're like, I don't want you to be with that person because they're emotionally negative. Maybe find ways to show them what it looks like to be in a relationship where someone's lifting you up completely. So maybe watch like find movies and watch movies that are going to show them that, or, (laughs) you know, it's a horrible example because I'm coming up with it on the fly, but there are a lot of things that you can do to kind of show them what they deserve without being that person that becomes the enemy because you're trying to get them out of what they don't see yet. Yeah. I can imagine it being a gentle conversation where you really kind of have to let them unlock in their own brains, the, Mm -hmm. the truth that you're trying to show them rather than, have it be externally sourced, which probably won't work, especially if you're already partway through the planning process. So going back to divorce, is there, is there any common mistakes that you see people uh, tend to fall into when they're uh, getting divorced, whether it's, you know, approaching it from a mental standpoint or financially, or just either tips for common, common problems people uh, tend to run into? Yes, absolutely. So I would say there are a lot of common, but I like to, I I don't know, like two or three I'll give you. So the first one, and I think this one drives everything else. So I think it's the most important is letting your emotions lead the way is a pretty common mistake. And the the thing here is I, I, it's kind of funny to call it a mistake because even though I call it a mistake, I don't Mm. think it's something that you can truly correct. Yeah. Emotions are tough. Yeah. So I think it's better to not say, don't fall into this trap of letting your emotions lead the way. I think it's better to say, be prepared for your emotions to go crazy and, you know, be prepared to have an emotional battle and know that, you know, emotions can easily overcome logic and they can force you to act out of fear, sadness, anger, you know, guilt. So you want to try to do everything you can from as soon as possible forward to get your, get, get a hold of your emotions and get your emotions under control. That way you can think logically and really get the things that you desire out of the divorce, whether you want the divorce or not, Mm -hmm. you know, and like I said, emotions, this can impact you with all of the other things in the divorce process. So if your emotions are out of control, you might be spending more time with lawyers than you need to, hence more financial burden. Yeah. Uh, You could be having inefficient conversations with your soon to be ex spouse and, you know, not really communicating efficiently enough to get what you want and maybe causing more strife than, than actually solving problems. And so emotions are definitely the biggest one. And then I would say not having a plan for thriving and rebuilding is is probably the other one because if you don't have a plan, you don't know where you're going to go. Just like if you get in your car 
and you just start driving, you could end up anywhere. <laughs> but if you get in your car and you know you want to go to Chick-fil-A, then you know how to get to Chick-fil-A. So you have to know where you want to go. And if you don't know where you want to go or how you're going to get there, then you're just going to go in circles and it it just gets really messy. So I think once you know, you know, whether you want it or not, that the divorce is imminent, mm -hmm. the sooner that you can come up with a plan, a plan to get you know, a plan of what you expect to get out of the divorce, a plan for what you want after the divorce. That way you can start working towards it, even in small baby steps. Yeah. And make sure it's realistic. So don't go on Sunday if you want Chick-fil-A. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so you mentioned in your divorce, you struggled because you, you said you didn't believe in it. Uh, is there something you'd, you'd say to those who are in a similar situation where they're like, oh, marriage is forever. And I can't get divorced. Are there people uh, you'd like to, who, if there's anybody listening who's in that situation, what would you tell them? I don't know if you'd point them to the, hey, stop believing in marriage kind of thing, or if it's more of a gentle uh, leading them to, to question whether or not they're getting what they really need out of this relationship. Yeah, I think it's important to be open minded because what I found about myself, and I think most people would agree, is we often have opinions that change over time. And so it might take the force of something out of our control to change our opinion on that. You know, like maybe, you know, I'm sure everyone's had an opinion on parenting, right? And sometimes it takes having a kid that doesn't go along with that parenting opinion for you to change your opinion on it, <laughs> you know? So just be open-minded to the fact that your opinion might change. And I know for me, uh, just through personal, the personal experience of it, you know, not believing in it to going through it. It was the best thing that ever happened to me, to me. And I fully believe in it now. I don't, I don't think it should be used as a crutch to not do work on something that's salvageable, mm -hmm. but I, I do think that it's a tool or a resource out there that you can use to, to get the things that you desire out of life and are worthy of because this life is so, so short and if you're going to spend it, you, you don't want to spend it in something that's going to make you unhappy for the rest of your life. So, you know, if that means that you have to go through the pain of a divorce or doing something you never thought that you could or would do, it could be worth it. Like it has been for me because I've never been happier. I was forced to face my my childhood traumas. I was forced to overcome my negative and toxic behaviors and I'm a better person because of it. And I'm in a better relationship because of it. And people around me are better because of it. So it really can be a blessing in disguise. Well, that's a great way to look at it. I think it's perfect um, for the subject of the podcast, which is failure. And, uh, you know, it can feel like I'm sure when you're going through a divorce that you are, you know, in some sorts of failure. And I, I don't tend to use that word as a a final destination type of term. It's more like a, a misstep on the way towards where you need to be. But before we get to any of the, a couple of the forward looking questions, is there anything else based on your past or your experience with failure that you want to touch on before we start looking for, you know, to the more forward looking uh, type of stuff? Uh, the only other thing I would say is I know that maybe listening to this, it might sound like I have it all together, <laughs> but you know, there, and I don't, nobody does. <laughs> But I am, I am in a much, much better place. However, you know, I don't know that we had touched on this yet. And just in case, you know, anyone might be helped by hearing this, I want everyone to know that there was a point throughout my marriage where I felt completely hopeless and even considered taking my own life. I had gotten that, you know, far down into the depths of despair. And so I want people to know just, I don't want to say that for any pity or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I want to say it because I want people to know that you can go from that to something magically tremendous. And I always like to compare it to, it's so cliche, so cliche. So it's, it almost hurts to say it, but the caterpillar that turns into a butterfly. And the only reason I like to bring it up is because I actually did some search and I'm a total nerd. And when I found this out, I, I was like, what? So when the caterpillar goes into the cocoon before they turn into a butterfly, the tissue literally breaks itself down. So it becomes really disgusting and gooey. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's literally what happened to me and happens, especially if you're going through divorce or any type of thing that makes you feel a sense of failure is you probably break your own self down into a gooey mess. 
whether that's toxic behavior, thoughts of, you know, not being able to continue, whatever that is, Mm -hmm. you can't stop there. You can't let that defeat you because you can, what happens to the caterpillar can happen to you. Yeah. That gooey mess rebuilds into something absolutely magical that you do not want to miss out on. So that's the only other thing I'd really want to put out there. Yeah, I know. I think that's a great point because I might not have gone through a similar situation in terms of divorce, but I mean, I've had certainly many relationships, but also just times in my life where I felt the worst. It actually gives you that freedom to rebuild yourself in the way that you wish you were because you realize that all those uh, previous thoughts of who you are and who you were, well, they don't not only apply, but they don't have to apply if they weren't serving you before. And so you can kind of rebuild with intention. And if if you want to emerge as a butterfly or maybe even something more uh, beautiful, who knows what that is? Uh, you know, when you're in that lumpy mess uh, period is when you have the biggest ability to change, you know, who you are, not only to yourself, but, uh, you know, outwardly to the public and just reshape what it means to be you. So I think that's, uh, that's you know, great advice for anybody who's feeling like they're in the lows, especially because it, it gives you a chance to really rethink, well, what what does it mean to be me and what are my most important values and how can I uh, strengthen some of those things where I've, you know, let them go in the past. So I think that's, that's great advice. Being a guest on the show, you get what's called a get out of fail free card. And what that can be used for is similar to the monopoly card. Um, but instead of getting out of jail, you get out of a uh, possible potential future failure. And so what I would say is if you, if you're going to use this card and you could, spend it, so to speak, on any career or hobby or passion or thing that, let's say playing piano or whatever it is that you've that you've avoided because you think there'd be too much failure or you wouldn't be good at it. Is there something you would use that get out of fail free card to pursue if uh, failure was not a, not an option? Maybe a Broadway star or who knows? I'm not leading you down any specific path, but you know probably more than I do what uh, what dreams you've had that you've you've kind of tucked away just because there seems to be an inordinate amount of failure uh, waiting for you down that path. Oh, geez. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is like my childhood career dream, I think, which would be an SNL actress or some type of <laughs> comedic acting career. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I use stand-up comedy as mine. Typically, uh, maybe I would use getting in good physical shape because I have a lot of trouble <laughs> with that. But uh, but yeah, comedy is tough because you have to um, you have to fail in front of people mm-hmm. a lot in order yes. to understand what's funny. So that's, that's cool. So you'd want to be uh, kind of like an improv ish, I guess it's, it's also scripted, but um, a star on SNL. Yep. That was, that was the dream. <laughs> what did you have a favorite person in SNL growing up when you had that dream? Probably Will Ferrell. Yeah. Yes. He's, he's up there for me too. I think uh, Will Ferrell, Chris Farley, David Spade, uh, Adam Sandler, a lot of those. Yeah. A lot of those people from, I guess it was the nineties. Yes. That whole cast. And I just, I feel like I just have pretty similar, pretty similar humor to, to Will Ferrell. So it just, you know, like the childish, I like to just do the most outrageous things to make people laugh kind of thing. Yeah. I'm sure having kids too helps bring out some of that, that childlike. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it does. <laughs> um, and then what is the, uh, the next thing you're going to fail at? Um, not necessarily on purpose, but what is, are you undertaking any new business ventures or parts of your self, or maybe you're writing a new book? What's the next thing you're going to fail at? As I say, fail it till you nail it. Oh, I love that. Fail it till you nail it. So I honestly just, so just published the book, it, like October 14th. So a couple of weeks ago. Oh, perfect. So that if you had asked me maybe a couple of weeks ago, I would have said that, (laughs) but it went pretty well. I would say, you know, just the promotion of getting the word of the book out there, as well as my, my services and my career as a, a divorce coach, because any type of coaching out there, while it is so needed and so necessary and so crucial to help other people, it is a challenging marketing venture to take on. And so that is what I'm trying to fail at right now. Yeah. I mean, it's tough because you say either the words life coach or coaching and people put you in a box. And so Mm -hmm. being able to uh, differentiate yourself, but also tell them your story before they put a story in their heads as to what that could be certainly can be a challenge, but congratulations on getting the book uh, published. 
I'm sure that's a, a huge uh, burden off your shoulders. And now, yeah, to your point, you have to uh, go about convincing people to uh, to listen to what you put into the book, which I imagine is yeah. <laughs> is a, a bit a big struggle. So where can people go if they want to find out more about the book yourself, uh, any of the things you're working on these days, where's the best place for people to find you? So you can find information about the book and my coaching services on divorcebucketlist.com. Uh, the book is also available on Barnes and Noble, Amazon, all major retailers as well. Very cool. How, how long did the book take to write? Just out of curiosity. Besides, I mean, if you don't have to count it as when you started the bucket list uh, that night with the wine, but I didn't know uh, <laughs> once you decided to write it, how long that process took. I would say from the day I put the first few words together till completion was two years, but that's only because when I started writing it, it was literally the day after I gave the speech, but I was still going through the process and learning more as I was going. And so I wasn't fully ready to get everything that I had to say out. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually I, I even encountered a, a period of time where I just didn't feel worthy of writing it. Like I'm not a published author. I don't, who's going to read this. And I was afraid. So I actually think I put it down for about nine months, didn't even touch it, didn't look at it. And then finally, I, I just said, you know what, it's now or never picked it up. And I went from, I think 5,000 words to almost 50,000 words in a week. Oh, wow. So I just decided it's time to get done. <laughs> yeah. And no one is a published author until they're a published author. So I mean, holding that against you, I don't know how you can become one unless you... <laughs> We're born with a story written in your hand. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta write it. Uh, I think I've done when I first started with the failure guy thing, it, it was like a, an idea for a book. So I wrote maybe 3000 words one night and then I put that away. And so at some point I'll pick that back up. And, and I think speaking with people like you is, is helping me understand all the various types of failure and feelings that go along with it. So I, I appreciate you for coming on your show on the show, sharing your story. I definitely um, would suggest anybody who's interested to go check out your website. Again, that's divorcebucketlist.com or I imagine you're um, on any of the social medias. Uh, is there anyone you, you prefer, maybe Instagram or, or one of those? Uh, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and I think that's it, but it's, uh, under divide guide, Jen with two N's. Okay, great. And then I kind of heard you say the word clubhouse at one point, but not really. Do you use that uh, much at all? I haven't really started publishing stuff on there yet as though, though it's part of the business plan, but I listen to it all the time. I truly believe in surrounding yourself with people that you you want to have similar lives to or mindsets as. Mm -hmm. And so I am just constantly on there listening to entrepreneurs, successful and motivational people. Awesome. Uh, well, yeah, we should connect on there. And uh, I would also Definitely. suggest anybody who has a specific um, uh, niche or whatever, wants to learn more about certain things. Uh, this month is ADHD awareness month when we're recording it. So I uh, have been spending a lot of time in the ADHD groups, but um, clubhouse can be, as long as you can sort through the the BS and the reality okay. show type rooms, there's a lot of good, good stuff on there. Um, but I wanted to thank you for coming on the show and and sharing more of yourself. I know it's not. I'm sure you've gone through this a lot of times. You know, bearing your soul not only in the book but on stage and and through everything like that. So I'm sure it gets easier. But I do appreciate you taking the time out of your day today to uh, to come share with my listeners your story. And I hope uh, the promotion of the book goes well. And uh, and I look forward to uh, hearing more of your successes in the future. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. Would you like to be more efficient, productive, and confident in your work at the office? Over 750 million people worldwide use Excel, yet it's still a misunderstood and frequently misused tool. That's why I created Excel Exposure, so you can work smarter and not harder. The Excel Essentials course gives you over five hours of in-depth video lessons, plus it comes along with my master workbook which has every function, shortcut, and all the examples to follow along. Investopedia actually included my course in their list of six best online Excel classes of 2021, saying it's best for visual learners. As someone who's an expert in failure, I can certainly teach you and your team how to avoid spreadsheet failures and create bulletproof Excel documents. Use the coupon code FAILURE for 20% off of the lifetime access price. 
Visit ExcelExposure.com for more information and also my existing award-winning free training. Thanks for joining me on the Failure Guy podcast. If you enjoyed it, feel free to tell somebody. And don't forget, always try to fail it till you nail it. Till next time.